Welcome to the RV Podcast, and this is episode 447. And in this episode, we're going to talk about how not to lose your pet while you're on a camping trip. Hello, everybody. I'm Mike Wendland, and this is my lifelong traveling companion and my bride, Jennifer, and we are delighted to have you with us on the podcast. I uh, should tell you that the podcast is simulcast on YouTube and, uh, of course, on our blog, rvlifestyle.com, and the audio version is available for download on all of your favorite podcast apps, and uh, you can also listen to the podcast at rvlifestyle.com. So we hope you've subscribed to the podcast on YouTube and on the apps. And uh, give us a thumbs up, if you will. It would help the podcast get more widely circulated, which is always a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, we've got a lot to talk about this week. In this week's episode, we're going to talk and introduce you to a real-life pet detective uh, who tells us, what to do if our dog runs away while we're on a camping trip. And that happens a lot. We're also going to check the latest social media buzz, but real RVers are talking about. And we're going to uh, introduce you to a brand new spin-off blog that we've just launched from RV Lifestyle, CampingFoodRecipes.com. And this is going to be totally dedicated to one of the most popular topics that we've had in our 11 plus years now of RVing and that has to do with what do you eat when you're on the road, how to make great meals and still enjoy your favorite outdoor activities. Brand new blog had just launched campingfoodrecipes.com. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and then we've got even more stuff to yeah, talk about. Then we share a tip about taking care of your tires on your RV. And that certainly is a topic that everybody talks about. And then we have a question that's very common right now is, what do you do when you're in your RV and you have to be someplace and the wind really picks up? When is there too much wind? When should you stay put? That's coming up a little bit later. But this week finds uh, Jen and I doing some traveling. We're on our way to Elkhart, Indiana this week, the RV capital of the world. We're going to check out uh, a brand new uh, RV, a little Class B RV that we're really excited to uh, visit the factory. And we'll tell you more about that. That'll be a future report we do. And Class Bs always have a little special place in my heart because that's what we first started out with in our RV Yep, we love Class Bs, and uh, well, we love all RVs. Yeah, we let's do. Be, let's be here. And then uh, later in the week, I'm heading down to something I have been looking forward to for a long time, and that is I'm going down near Dayton, Ohio, to what's called Hamvention, and that is a uh, worldwide gathering of amateur radio operators. They literally come from all across the world, and uh, this is the premier gathering for them, and uh, we're working on a story about RVing and why amateur radio is such a great ha hobby to be in. We're going to meet a lot of RVers who have amateur radio in their RVs, and I, I'm really excited about going down there. Um, you said you were going. What about Bo? Bo's not going. Oh. Bo's not allowed. They don't allow dogs in there. I mean, <laughs> I you, just, you know, just decent. <laughs> you, I suppose I could say he's a service dog. Put a little... <laughs> Little antenna on his head and uh, yeah. backpacks and some radios on him. Bo is your dog. Bo is not going to understand that Daddy's abandoned him. <laughs> I think the Bo idea. Bo is your shadow. You know, you've seen people put Easter Bunny things on their dog. I could put like antennas on a dog, and he could be my mobile command post. You know. <laughs> so no dogs. Uh, no, well, you know, there's too many people crowd around small little aisles, and you know, it just it doesn't yeah, really. Yeah, dogs don't really fit then. Yeah. Uh, hey, let's uh, check in with uh, the social media buzz this week. One of the best ways to find out what everybody is talking about in the RV community, uh, find out what real RVers are talking about, is to look at our RV Lifestyle uh, uh, Facebook group. And uh, it's like 180,000 members strong now. Wendy Boyer is one of our uh, control agents, <laughs> and she is our social media guru for the podcast, and she's got this report for us this week. Hi, Mike and Jen. One post that got lots of people talking this week was from Victoria. Victoria was camping in southern Louisiana. She went out to walk her dog around the camp campground, and she saw thousands of swarming termites. 
Yes, termites, you heard me right. She didn't know what to do and she, so she put a post out asking, what do I do to protect my RV from termites? Well, lots of people got talking. Carol was one of many who said, are you sure these are termites? Apparently swarming ants look very similar. And Victoria said, yes, I'm sure these are termites. Uh, Ron, he shared a story about a mini Winnie he once had that he parked for a couple years in his driveway. And he said he went out to sell it one day, clean it up. He went in there and termites had gotten in and a four by eight piece of plywood over the cab was dust. He had to just total the whole thing. There were so many comments back and forth, uh, but Joe perhaps had the bottom line that seemed pretty comforting to me. He said when termites swarm, they are actually dying. And he said their colonies live about 10 feet underground and they attack wooden structures from underneath the ground. So for Victoria with her RV, as long as she gets out of that campground, her RV is moving and she should be just fine. Next, I'd like to share a post from Pamela. Pamela needed some ideas. So she took a picture of her kitchen in her Class C and asked, what should I put in this tiny space above my microwave? I'll share the picture with you right here. She needed ideas and she sure did get them. Some suggested she put some spices in there, others dish towels, others your breads, your hamburger buns, that sort of thing. But it seemed like the majority of the folks thought paper goods, napkins, foils, that was the way to go. So uh, Pamela, let us know what you decide. And the last post I'd like to share with you today is from Juan. And it's one of my favorite kind of posts because it's a picture of somebody in a place that's a destination. So what was Juan's destination? Bucky's. Juan said he was driving from Pennsylvania down to Florida, saw a Bucky's, and so he had to stop to see it for himself. And he took a picture of he, his wife, and his kids inside. He said it was totally worth the hype. For those of you who don't know, Bucky's is this really big gas station convenience store, and I mean really big. Some say like 100 gas pumps, and the store has its own food and t-shirts and all types of stuff inside. It's become sort of a destination for some RVers. So he went, he shared, he uh, was excited that he did, and many people were excited for him. And that's it for me this week. I'm Wendy Boyer. You can see me over at the RV Lifestyle Facebook group. You know, I have got to say, I have never thought about termites when camping. I, yeah. I That has never entered my head that that would be a concern. Ants? Yeah. Yeah. Bees? Bees yeah. yeah. But termites? Rodents? Yeah. yeah. Rodents? Yeah. Yeah. But not termites. You can tell yeah. them from the north, I guess. Yeah. Hey, we've got an excited announcement for you because we're going to talk about uh, a new blog that we just launched. Literally, as this podcast is being uh, released, uh, it, we're really excited to tell you about CampingFoodRecipes.com. Over the years, we have had more questions about meal prep, you know? I mean, everybody, you want to know what to take. What's the easiest thing to take? How, what can I take food so we can eat good food? Not have to eat fast food, junk food, because uh, we didn't bring the right things. Hey, we should point out, if you hear some hammering, we're in our uh, still being remodeled Sticks and Bricks house in Michigan. And that's some of our, uh, our remodelers over a couple of rooms over doing some work. But CampingFoodRecipes.com is the name of the blog. And the editor of CampingFoodRecipes.com is Jerrica Ma. And uh, as our, this blog launches, it launches with a, a particular theme in mind for you because it's Memorial Day weekend coming up. It's the uh, unofficial start of summer and you want to not be a slave of the campfire or the kitchen in the RV when you're out camping. So Jerrica has the whole uh, first uh, edition of uh, CampingFoodRecipes.com uh, is devoted to Memorial Day food recipes. Here's Jerrica with a preview. Hi, Jennifer, Mike, and everyone who loves camping and eating. This is Jerrica with CampingFoodRecipes.com, and I'm here to share with you about our easy-to-make recipe lineup that we have just in time for Memorial Day weekend. Uh, we got the super easy burger recipe that'll make you wonder why you're cooking burgers any other way, and a leftover hamburger casserole so you can put those burgers to good use the next day. 
Um, and of course, it wouldn't be Memorial Day weekend without hot dogs. So we teach you how to elevate the boring camping hot dog um, by getting rid of the, the ketchup and mustard and replacing it with New York style or Chicago style hot dogs. And of course, we can't forget about dessert. And so in honor of Memorial Day weekend, we have the Patriot Biscuit Cup um, and also the All-American S'mores. So jump on over to campingfoodrecipes.com to check out those recipes and more. Um, and if you like, you can even submit your own recipe to be featured on the website. Um, so that's it for me today, but I'll see you next week with another great camping food recipe. Now, Jerrica is going to be a regular every week, and we can't wait for what she's going to tell us and what an appropriate time to start hers at a uh, holiday weekend. Yeah. Uh, check, check out the recipes. Honest, there is... There are some really great recipes, campingfoodrecipes.com. One of the coolest thing is, is that you can also contribute some recipes too. And we hope this becomes the go-to source on the internet. Uh, uh, just as you plan your road trip out, that you use campingfoodrecipes.com to plan your meals so that you can eat good, that's important, you know, and, uh, and still have a lot of fun. All right, when we come back, we're going to introduce you to a real-life pet detective a big problem is when we travel with our pets, it happens all the time. We hear these reports almost weekly about dogs, and I suppose cats too, but particularly dogs running away while you're on an RV trip. Boy, talk about something that can ruin that trip quick. And we are gonna introduce you to somebody who can tell you what to do if that happens to you. The one thing that can ruin a perfect RV trip is a bad mattress. And believe us, we know over the years, we've tried many and found them all wanting until now. Now we sleep on the RV mattress by Brooklyn Bedding. Quite simply, it's the best we've ever slept on. We chose a queen-sized Aurora Lux medium firm mattress that arrived tightly rolled in a box. All we had to do is put it on the bed, unroll it, and wait for it to recover from the compression. Then we put the sheets and the bed covers on and we found we slept so well on it that we ordered another one for our home. That's how comfortable it is. Our sleep is now so luxurious and deep that we can't imagine using a different mattress. Shipping is free, and if you're disappointed with the current mattress in your RV, you owe it to yourselves to try the RV mattress by Brooklyn Bedding. Brooklyn Bedding sends out all of their RV mattresses from their own factory in Arizona. That means they're able to use premium materials at a reasonable price for you with no middleman bringing up the cost. And right now, if you visit rvmattress.com slash RV lifestyle, you'll get the maximum discount off your mattress with the promo code RV lifestyle. Again, use the promo code RV lifestyle for a big discount on your RV mattress by Brooklyn Bedding. We're sure you'll be as thrilled with your RV mattress by Brooklyn Bedding as we are with ours. It really is the most comfortable mattress we've ever slept on. Boy, you know, most RVers camp with pets, and those pets, and it's inevitable with so many RVers, so many pets out there, that some would get lost, and it's such a scary thing when you lose your pet. And uh, recently, didn't we just, somebody from our Facebook group just had their dog gone for 30 hours, and uh, they were camping in Texas, Texas State Park, and it was such a frightening thing. Yeah, and that's why the interview of the week this week is about what to do if your dog runs away, or also you can look at it as how to keep your dog from running away. Uh, I think even we had another case in North Carolina last week, uh, or last month, I guess it was. They lost their dog uh, when somebody at the campground were letting off, was letting off fireworks, and <sighs> the dog um, has been gone for a month now, and to our knowledge, is is still missing. So. As the camping season begins, we think it's important to bring out of the podcast a, a, an expert who can help us know first what we can do to prevent our pet from running away and then what to do if they do run away. Uh, she is Annalisa Burns and she is the owner, search dog handler and licensed private investigator at Pet Search and Rescue. Uh, it specializes in helping people find their lost pets and she offers uh, coaching and then she will lead and go off across the country doing in-person searches. Uh, she's been to California and to Florida 
20 years of experience finding missing pets, and she is a wealth of information, and we're going to introduce her to you right now. Wonderful to be here and so thrilled to be sharing information about keeping pets safe to our viewers. Well, it is an important topic, especially now as uh, with uh, the summer uh, travel season about ready to start. A lot of people taking their dogs out and it's been a long time of being cooped up in the wintertime. Uh, how common is it for a dog to get lost while camping? It's very common and I'm going to make it a little bit more broad. It's common for a dog to go missing anytime they're in an unusual situation or circumstance. So whether that's camping or going on holiday over a weekend at an unknown hotel or to a family member's house, they're just at a higher risk of going missing when they're outside of their normal territory and their normal schedule. There are additional factors like uh, fireworks and other people doing other things, other animals, and all of that can contribute to a pet going missing. Now, you've been doing this for 20 years uh, or so now. Did, well, how did you get into this? What was your first case like? Well, I came to this, yeah, almost 20 years ago, and I had adopted a puppy from San Diego Humane Society. And she had some major behavioral issues. I'm sure some of your listeners and viewers can relate to a dog you get and they just want to chew everything up and bark at everything. And so I went to an animal behaviorist and she told me my dog needed a job. So that was the beginning of looking for something that I could do that was meaningful with my first search dog. And by the way, a little side note here, anybody out there who's looking for a side hustle or an amazing thing to do with their high energy pet, to consider helping to find lost pets with their dog because many dogs are great at using their nose to sniff out missing pets. So that's what I did. I had this great shelter dog and we took training um, with Cat Albrecht of Missing Animal Response, uh, 20 years now almost, and um, trained my dog to help find missing pets. Now the first lost dog case I ever went on, you'll be interested to hear this, was a dingo mix that had been shipped from Australia to Los Angeles. The owners who were from Texas camped all the way to Los Angeles to pick up their dog and then were camping all the way back to Texas. Well, when they were at a national park, the dog got away and they thought for sure this dingo mix from Australia would be long gone and they were packing up to head home. Um, they had been camping at this place just a very short period of time and the dog backed out of its harness, which is quite common for a shy skittish dog to do that. And so they had me come out with my search dog that I had adopted at the shelter and I was able to work my dog in the area and based on scent my dog indicated that their dog named Jade actually was still in the area and she indicated where the dog was getting a water source and food. So I coached the owners and said, no, you know, try to stay. You need to put out a humane trap because the dog is so skittish. And they were lucky that the people camping the next night was a very kind family and they put out some yummy smelling meat in the trap and the dog went in. It saved the dog's life. It saved the family's vacation and experience and was absolutely amazing. And I was hooked on helping people find their lost pets. So my very first dog case was from somebody uh, who lost a dog while camping. So what sort of factors go into a dog running away while camping? What, why do they run away? Well, the number one thing I'm going to say is the dog's personality. All dogs have different personalities, no matter the breed. And some dogs, whether it's because of an experience they've had or from birth, just their innate personality, they're more shy or skittish. And so they're more likely to respond to a fearful experience 
run now, ask questions later versus a super friendly dog that goes up to everybody that maybe has a more stable personality, a less reactive personality. When something unusual happens, they're likely to more stand their ground or stay with the owner. So that's the most important factor to consider for someone who is camping or RVing with their dog is it, it does my dog do well when scary things happen um, in new circumstances, in new situations. The second thing is something you can't predict and you can't control a lot of the time. And that is just the unexpected happening, a car accident, um, fireworks is a big one. Um, you know, an unknown person or pet messing around with your RV or, or animal, you know, an animal like a bear, those sorts of things. That's totally unexpected. And your pet is going to respond in an unexpected way. It, it, what's the best thing to do if a dog does run away and you're out in the wilderness someplace or in a campground? You know, the instinct is to go chase after it and yell and holler for it. Is, is that the best thing or, or what, 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 do you, what do you recommend? Well, no, yelling after your pet generally is not the best thing to do, especially if you're panicked and your pet is in a panic because you're sending potentially the message, this is a bad situation, you know, run now as you're screaming after them. It seems to be encouraging that behavior. So it's really easy to say and really hard to do, which is stay calm, be calm, try to have your wits about you. And the most important thing is to follow the pet at a distance and keep an eye on where they go, because more than likely they're not going to run three miles in the first sprint. They're going to go relatively nearby. And that's where you need to have an uh, your visual on them. So it might be following in a car, it might be following on foot, but not chasing them. Um, that's really the most important. Now, the exception to this rule, unfortunately, is gunfire and fireworks, because when they continuously go off again and again and again, then the pet is being sort of re-triggered to run, run, run. And then they can cover a lot, you know, greater distances. So being calm, not screaming after the pet, trying to keep a visual on them. And then immediately you want to gather as many resources as possible to help you in your search. So that means maybe calling a family or friend, friend who lives in the area, maybe your camping partner or some other RV friends, because it really oftentimes takes more than just one person to find a missing pet. When do you call in a professional? And, and I guess more important is how do you find one? Well, that's a hard thing to do. There's only about a dozen people who help find lost pets using search dogs and in the US. And then there are additional people who utilize trapping, witness development, those sorts of techniques. So the, the best way to find people and also the best way if you're interested in this as a, a career or a hobby is to reach out to missinganimalresponse.com. That's the uh, organization that Kat Albrecht runs and she has online training and she also has a national directory that lists everyone who's gone through her training and has the credentials to go out there. There are quite a few scam artists, unfortunately. So make sure you check training references and case references and credentials. And so finding somebody on the list at missinganimalresponse.com is an excellent way to find out what resources are in a, any given area. Because obviously, if you're out camping, if you're in your RV, you could be someplace you don't know anybody in the area. So you want to know that website and follow that directory. Um, we as far as when to call someone out, um, that's a little bit more case specific um, because it depends on are you, is the dog really friendly? Was it fireworks? Was it 
a shy dog? Are you staying there for another two weeks or are you leaving tomorrow? There's a lot of factors that go into it. I would say as soon as you realize you're not finding your pet, go ahead and find out what those resources are in the area and let them know of the situation so they at least are aware of what's going on and then they can give you that feedback about when they're available and what they would recommend that you do in the meantime. Do the dogs know where they are enough to get back home usually? That's a really great question. And unfortunately, there has not been any large scale studies on dogs and their homing instincts. There's been small studies. There's been some some interesting studies were do, done during World War II. Some dogs do have a better ability, a homing instinct than others. So one of the hard things is you don't know when your dog goes missing if it's one of the ones that has a good homing instinct or not. Um, most of the time we do find that dogs lost away from home will circle back to the last place they saw their beloved owner. So it is important to maintain a presence in that area for if your pet comes back. And actually, I just heard of a case example where a pet went missing from a pet sitter's house or a new place they had just gone and the dog still circled back to see if they, you know, what was going on in that area. I remember one camping trip several years ago, a bunch of us were in the middle of the woods and one of the, the uh, women that was in our group lost her dog. Her dog ran off. It's a small little dog. And uh, it was a Sunday. Everybody had to be at work on Monday in the city and uh, they searched and searched and nothing was found. And I remember as we left, uh, Jennifer, my wife took, the food that we had for our dog and just threw it, you know, in the, along the side of where we had been camping. And, uh, during the middle of the week, uh, some people went back, looked, called, couldn't find her, put posters up, all the things, you know, you do. And then the following weekend we went up camping and there the dog was, it had been eating that food and it was just sitting, lying down, waiting for somebody to come on the campsite. So, that's why I asked that question. Uh, this was a dog that had never been there before. And uh, it was just, uh, it got excited and, and took off. Um, how do people get a hold of you? You are such a wealth of information on all of this. And if they have questions or if they need your services. Absolutely. And I also want to encourage anybody out there, you know, this is such a rewarding profession to help people find their lost pets and to work with our beloved dogs to help people and animals. If anybody is interested in this line of work, I'm happy to answer questions about that too. It's amazing and very, very fulfilling. Um, you can reach me on my website, pet searchandrescue.com. Again, that's petsearchandrescue.com. That's also my Facebook URL, uh, Pet Search and Rescue. And you can also reach me on my cell phone. Yes, I give out my cell phone number because I want to help everybody who has a lost pet. And I want to encourage as many people to be helping people find their lost pets. And my cell phone is 310-880-8268. Again, that's 310-880-8268. Call or text anytime. We will put this in the show notes and in the description below uh, as people listen and watch this. Um, the, uh, you said earlier at the very stop, uh, top of the interview when you were talking about this as a rewarding professor, you said dogs need a job. And I had heard that before. Uh, elaborate on that a little bit for us. Absolutely. Well, not every dog needs a job. I mean, you definitely have couch potato dogs that, you know, want to watch TV with you and that's their job. But a lot of dogs have great energy and passion and they want to go out there and use their nose. And so searching for lost pets is a great thing for their enrichment and also to help other missing pets. Um, For example, there's many dogs in the shelter that the owners turn in because the dog has too much energy, the dog is too destructive, like the puppy I got at the shelter many years ago, and those dogs actually can make amazing search dogs. Now, search dogs for missing people 
that, um, you know, obviously has a lot of very strict criteria, rightfully so. And there's specific search teams across the United States that you join and do your training with. But for lost pets, it can be much more enrichment and you can do it for fun also. Um, so there's a lot of different options available to you. There's online training, there's books about it, and of course, in-person um, options also. Well, we will send them to your website and the other resources that you've shared. And thank you for, uh, for a great interview. And I think uh, for all of us who are going to go out with our pets, the most important thing is don't scream and chase after them because you're just telling them that they were right to run, I guess. Exactly. And also number one preventative uh, tip is if you're traveling with your pet, always, always keep an ID tags and a collar on your pet, no matter what. And if you have a shy, skittish dog, you really always need to have GPS on the pet while you're traveling. Um, a friendly dog, maybe you don't put a GPS on, but I would, but always ID tags. And you recommend chipping as well? Microchipping is an excellent idea, but it does not like GPS. Your pet has to be scanned. So somebody has to find it and take the time to take it. it into the vet. So ID tags on a collar or an embroidered collar with the pet's uh, phone number and name or your phone number, the pet's name, that really is your pet's ticket home. And we'll, we'll put some resources to that. There's lots of places that will do that. Hey, Annalisa, thank you so much for being our guest on the podcast. And uh, we look forward to talking to you again sometime. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. That was a wealth of information, especially having your pet's name and phone number on your pet in case they get lost. And what a blessing she is that she's got her search dogs, that she's available, that you can call her in. Yep. If need be. We'll put links to all the resources that Annalisa just uh, shared with us in the show notes for this episode. And just go to rvlifestyle.com and click on the podcast tab there and you'll be able to find it. When we return, the RV news of the week. Jennifer and I bought some land just west of Nashville, Tennessee in a 5,300 acre estate. A beautiful collection of mountaintop properties called the Woodlands at Buffalo River. For us, it was the anecdote to crowded, expensive campgrounds and the end of worrying about reservations. These are big properties, 5 to 250 acres, and you can build a house, a cabin, outbuildings, or RV year-round starting at $79,900. Your property, your way, 100% ownership, and the scenery is breathtaking. You can landscape, garden, bring your pets, build what you want to, there's high-speed internet, and it is so private. It's a great place to make your home base. No more calling around for reservations. Is ready whenever you want. This is the final phase now. They are selling these on May 20th by appointment. Five to 250-acre properties from $79,900. There's great financing and big discounts on multi-lot packages. For information, visit myrvland.com. That's myrvland.com. Okay, now for the news. Our first story is U.S. News & World Report released its annual ranking of the 15 best national parks in the U.S., complete with pictures, descriptions, and reasons why you need to go there. Best national parks on the list include, you're going to be happy to hear, Glacier, That's Grand my Canyon. Glacier's my favorite. Yellowstone. That's Is, your favorite. Yosemite. Zion. Zion. I think it's both of our favorite. Grand Teton. Olympic. And Arches. And uh, we'll put a link to the whole list in the news uh, of the week uh, part of the podcast and the show notes at rvlifestyle.com. Uh, and we'll also put a link to uh, the best national parks for those of you who want to RV in solitude. Uh, and um, we've got several of our adventure guides are about national parks. So... Time to do your planning. Uh, hey, there was a big event in uh, Elkhart, the uh, RV uh, capital of the world last week. It was the um, Power Breakfast. They do it every spring. They bring in uh, top leaders in the industry and they talk about the trends. And they had pretty good attendance. Uh, I think they set a record for attendance for this breakfast. They were talking about ways to improve the camping experience. I'm kind of bummed we didn't go. I thought about it, but we would have had to get up really early in the morning to go to that. 
hmm. or go the night before, but then they would have been partying all the night before, and then we would have been even more tired if we got up. <laughs> the one thing that's nice about living what we do now in Kalamazoo is we're only 45 minutes. That's why we're going, as this podcast is being released, we're in Elkhart. <clears throat> but this, uh, this breakfast was pretty good. They talked about how the industry's taken a big hit because of high, high inflation, and uh, despite what you hear from Washington officially, the economy is struggling. Everybody knows that. And it's playing hard on the RV industry. Um, the uh, head of Campgrounds of America was the keynote speaker. And uh, Toby uh, shared ways that the industry can do a better job. Um, she says that they need to improve customer experience. And uh, so that those who buy an RV don't quit. And uh, there's a lot of talk about making better service available as well. Uh, and there, there's no doubt that sales are down significantly, which we have reported on every week. Um, the big reason, if you do the surveys, uh, inflation has caused a lot of people to hold off on big purchases. Uh, and those who have good credit ratings, they're looking at still 8% interest now, which is high. Um, so big, anyway, yeah. Big purchases these days are just buying groceries. Yeah. But I really like their emphasis on improving quality. Yes. And then uh, uh, they want sales representatives to understand what they're selling better. And then also to have m this ongoing need for more RV technicians so RVs can be serviced more quickly. I can tell you from our standpoint that that is what has turned many people off the whole RV experience is that when they have something go wrong, they call up the dealer and the dealer tells them they can't get them in for two months or they get them in in, a, in in a couple of weeks, and then it sits on their lot because they're too busy. You know, that's just unacceptable. It's unacceptable. And I think the industry is hearing that more and more. So anyway, that was the big power breakfast. See, we didn't have to go. We found out enough about it to talk about it. <laughs> uh, and we found uh, what I found interesting was that the age is getting younger of people buying RVs. Yes, yes. So yeah. that's interesting to know. But that positive experience that yeah. when you go on that campground. So the next story is the bears are waking up from their annual <laughs> hibernation. And that can only mean one thing. Bears aggression bears are aggressive and they're hungry when they first wake up paint creek you heard that expression a hungry, hungry bear, bear. yeah <laughs> yeah paint creek campground in the cherokee national forest is the latest to close temporarily because of aggressive bear activity bears in tennessee campgrounds were going into campsites and taking food a couple of campgrounds in Tennessee and camping areas off of the Appalachian Trail are also closed because of aggressive black bears. The U.S. Forest Service is reminding campers to keep food and garbage in bear-resistant containers. Also, do not run if you see a bear, but rather back away in the opposite direction. Uh, we, we'll put a, a link in the show notes with this podcast at rvlifestyle.com. Uh, to a story we've done on bear safety. And if uh, it's always good just to refresh your, your memory on what you should do. So uh, check that out. It'll be at rvlifestyle.com under the podcast tab. Yeah, because it always gets a little confusing because a black bear and a grizzly bear. They're both different. How They're you different handle bears, them. how yeah. you handle that situation. Another big trend uh, involving camping this year, Rocky Mountains National Park is now joining a handful of other national parks by basically going cashless for all of the entry and permit fees that you need to get in. And it's going to start at Rocky Mountain National Park on June 1st. National Park Service says that it, by eliminating cash payments, uh, it's going to speed up uh, ranger times at busy entry gates. Uh, you can get in. you got to have a credit card or a debit card. And you know, I think it's going to take just as long because i got to run and scan the card. But we'll see what happens. Uh, Mount Rainier National Park. Uh, announced earlier this year that it's going cashless uh, this starting this month in May, uh, and um, it's uh, only credit card payments only. So it's a trend that you're going to see across, I think, all the national parks. I think that with cash, you have to count it and keep track of it, so they probably just don't want to do that. Yep, yep. So our last story is a second grader who got lost on his family's annual camping trip in Michigan's Porcupine Mountains Wilderness State Park was found last week after spending two nights eating snow and sheltering under a log to survive. 
The eight-year-old was gathering wood to make a fire when he became lost. Search teams spent two days and two nights searching for him as temperatures dropped into the 40s. The boy told reporters he tried to leave muddy footprints uh, so he could be found, ate snow when he was hungry. Helicopters were brought in, canines, and about 150 people searched. He was found about two miles from his campsite. It is so easy to lose your sense of direction. What a smart young kid, though, you know. He knew it, what he had to do. Well, this was an annual he, trip yeah. camping. He probably is a, is a veteran out there. He'll go one or two ways. He'll either love the woods or he won't <laughs> want to go back. I bet he'll want to go back. I do, too. I, I just have a feeling. I have I don't a know. feeling, I'm too. Happy ending. Happy All ending. All right. When we come back, uh, RV Tip of the Week with uh, Queen Bee RV, and she is going to talk to us about uh, taking care of our RV tires. Stay with us. One of the most exciting developments for RVs is happening out west in Arizona. Western Land and Ranches is selling five-acre high-elevation ranches just off the famous Route 66, the birthplace of the American road trip. And these are beautiful, secluded tracts of land surrounded by majestic mountain ranges with sweeping valley views. The high elevation is a unique microclimate as well, giving you cooler temperatures, green grasses, and tree cover, making it unique for desert property. The community is in the center of it all, close to the best of the West, Grand Canyon, Las Vegas, Lake Havasu, Lake Mead, Lake Mojave, the Colorado River, Flagstaff, Sedona, and Historic Williams. If you're tired of crowded RV parks and paying high fees for sites, well, ownership might be right for you. This incredible collection of mountaintop properties called Greenwood Ranches hit the market and it's selling out fast. There is no HOA. You can build a house, a cabin, outbuildings, or just RV. It's your property, your way, 100% ownership. Visit the website to get details and set up a showing, ArizonaRVLand.net. That's ArizonaRVLand.net. When we're on a road trip, we always seem to find a way to stop at a Camping World Center. There are over 225 Camping World locations across the country, and there's always one close by when we need parts and accessories for our RV or just want to shop. In fact, uh, we have so much fun with uh, Camping World, and as we talk about it as one of our sponsors, they have agreed to offer a 10% discount if you use the coupon code RVLIFESTYLE10 when you buy $99 or more in merchandise. You'll find everything you want from outdoor furniture and appliances, the ones you see us use in our videos and that we talk about here in the podcast. RV extras that include everything from camping chairs to fire pits, electrical accessories, must-have gadgets. Check them all out. And again, don't forget, use the coupon code RVLIFESTYLE10 when you visit CampingWorld.com. And now it's time for the RV Tip of the Week. From Inspector Brenda of Queen Bee RV. And this week, she's going to give us some tips about the tires on our RV and how to do visual inspections uh, that you should perform before and during and after each trip. Here's Queen Bee RV herself, Brenda. A flat tire or a blowout can strike fear in the heart of any RVer. And I know this one from experience because I've had two of them while in transit. They're never convenient and they're pretty scary. So I thought that I would bring you some tire care tips so maybe you can avoid that in your RVing future. Now keep in mind you guys, these things, even if they look awesome, the seller might tell you they've never been used and they could look brand new to you, but there could be all kinds of issues going on that you need to be aware of. So I'm gonna give you a few ideas. Number one, I want you to have a good tire gauge on hand at all times, whether it's the little silver stick kind or the digital, I, la I use a digital monitor in my RV inspections and I really love that thing. Have it on hand all the time and make sure that the rate readings go high enough for the PSI rating on your tires. Also, take a PSI reading every single trip, two 
on the way back in between destinations and make sure you're getting a cold pressure reading. And that doesn't mean the ambient temperature. That means that the tires haven't been driven on that uh, right before you take your reading, that they're not hot. So take a cold pressure reading. You might even consider a TPMS, which is a tire pressure monitoring system. And those things are pretty cool. Know the DOT dates, the manufacturer dates of your tires. This is really important. You'll see three letters on the sidewall here, DOT, and then it'll have four numbers. And that's the two digit week and the two digit year, the born date, the manufacturer date of these tires. That's important because the NTSB and most tire manufacturers suggest that these things get replaced at the six year mark. And that's what we put in our inspection reports. So know the dates of all of your tires. You also want to do a visual inspection. Look at the tread, look at the sidewall. The tread you want to check for any nails or over or under inflation. You might see bald spots on the um, exterior or in the middle indicating over or under inflation. And then look at the sidewalls here to make sure there's no feathering or cracking, any kind of damage. That feathering and cracking can happen because of the UV rays. The sun is one of our worst enemies for these tires. So if you can, keep them covered and protected when you're out camping or when it's in storage. And all of these checklists, don't forget to apply it to the spare. Sometimes we forget that and when we need the spare is when we need the spare. So put that on your checklist. And lastly, when it comes time to replace them, do all the tires at the same time. That is the recommendation. So I hope these were helpful and I'll see you next time on another episode. Back to you, Mike and Jen. Boy, that's one thing that we can't save money on. When it's time to replace the tires, replace them all. Don't try to cut corners there. Yep. Hey, give me one new one and I'll add another one next month or no, all at once. Uh, all right. Brent is a regular on the podcast and you'll hear her back again next week with yet another RV tip. Right now it's time for the app of the week. And, uh, you know, apps make things so convenient. And, and uh, this week we want to just share a very simple one that uh, you all should have. And that is the Cracker Barrel app. Cracker Barrel is just a great place to stay when you don't want to pay for an expensive campground and you're going from here to there. And uh, most Cracker Barrels will let you stay. I love staying at a Cracker Barrel, especially because that means usually we can pick up breakfast there before we it. take off on the road. There's something great about waking up to the smell of bacon, and you smell it if you're staying in their parking lot. And it's okay to have a big rig. You can have a little rig or a big rig. Yeah. They have spots that will accommodate. Yep. Uh, Cracker Barrel app uh, shows all of the Cracker Barrel locations near you. And what Jen and I will often do is we'll say, well, where are we going to be? And like, we want to quit in like an hour, you know? And we usually wait until after their dinner hour until yes. their parking lot's open. And we'll see there's a parking lot, or there's a Cracker Barrel up ahead. And then we'll uh, we'll look it up on their app and we'll call them and say, hey, can we spend the night? Because you do need to check with the manager. And uh, you can even order takeout meals too. So you can say, hey, we're going to be at lunchtime. We're going to be, there's a Cracker Barrel up there. Uh, it's pretty good. So we'll put a link to the Cracker Barrel app in the show notes we under the that. podcast tab at rvlifestyle.com. Everybody needs that. Everybody does. Uh, and the app of the week is brought to you by our sister blog, newtraveltech.com, which kind of celebrates the way technology enhances the entire travel experience. Newtraveltech.com. Check them out. When we come back, the RV question of the week. When we're asked what's the most important modification we made to our RV, it's an easy answer. Battleborne batteries. Battleborne batteries are quality, safe, reliable lithium batteries that allow us to stay out there off the grid longer. Lithium batteries charge faster, they charge fuller, they're longer lasting, they're maintenance free. And battleborne batteries are protected by a 10 year guarantee. Now, in our case, they just dropped into the existing AGM batteries that we have. And they'll probably be the same on your rig too. Battleborne battery experts can get those in your rig just like they did with ours. They can also match you up with the right cabling, the inverter, the charger, the solar controller, everything. Jennifer and I swear by our Battleborne batteries. They allow us to boondock off the grid. Check them out. Go to rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. All right, it's time now for the RV question of the week. All right, here's the question. How much wind does it take 
before you won't drive. We're currently stuck in Twin Falls, Idaho, with 31 gusting to 45. Yeah, that's getting up there pretty good. Well, I guess it for us, it would depend on whether we're towing our fifth wheel or whether we are in our Class uh, C motorhome. Um, for sure, I would not uh, tow the fifth wheel uh, if I was, if, if the winds were gusting to 45, I would stay put until they cut the, those gusts drop down. Maybe we'd go in the motor home. If we could take, uh, it, when the winds are really strong like that, we try and get off the interstates and take two lane roads. And it also depends on which direction you're driving and which direction the wind is blowing. Right, right. Yeah, because if you, you don't want to, cr- it's the crosswinds that really make it hard. Uh, although a f- headwind can really uh, make things difficult too. And, uh, and then if you're getting passed by other vehicles, uh, that added to the wind, it, it can be challenging. So, you know, maybe we, you know, we, would, we would probably try it in the, fifth, in, the, uh, in the motorhome. Definitely not the fifth wheel if it was 45. It's just easier to stay put, hunker down. Um, that's part of the RV lifestyle. You've got to be flexible to say, you know what? We're not going to drive until conditions are a little safer, but I think uh, I think I, I think that we would probably stay put at forty-five miles an hour. Don't you think? I think so. Yeah, I know so because <laughs> you can't go out in that wind. And, yes, I can. No, but definitely we wouldn't tow in that in that wind, uh, and probably it, it depends on where we are in the uh, if we were going to take the the smaller motor home. Hey, we would love to get your questions. You can reach us through our personal email, Mike and Jen at RVLifestyle.com. Well, that's the show this week. Happy trails.